Welcome to the Bill Cartwright Show. I have a 13-year, four-time NBA champ, uh, great guy, Will Purdue. Well, welcome to the show. Well, how come you didn't say teammate? What, what happened to that part? You didn't want to refer to me as a former teammate? You know, we are so bonded. That is just <laughs> a given that every single person on the planet knows that we were teammates. Um UK man, rookie, uh, did, did a great, great job. And uh, yeah, that's just common knowledge. Come on, you gotta, you gotta understand that. You know, it's interesting, Bill, it's that it, it, you bring that up. You know, I watch the league now and players, even like veteran players are so young. And I always think about how fortunate I was to go to a team with such established veterans and I don't mean this in a bad way, and I apologize if you take it the wrong way, but, you know, guys like yourself and John Paxson who, you know, had taken their lumps in the league, and especially a guy like you had, who had uh, dealt with a lot of adversity. And I just feel very fortunate that that has happened, and I feel like a lot of guys now, even when, like, like the Bulls, for example, like one of the oldest players on the team is Zach Levine, but I think he's only 25 and this is his eighth year. And you're like, man, that guy is so young compared to the guys I was getting advice from when I first came in the league right out of college. So it's just, everything's different, but I've always told you, I've been very fortunate. I thank you for your advice. And I'm sure you're about to give me the same answer. You always give me, I still owe you plenty of meals. Yeah. Well, of course you do. That's not about <laughs> church. <laughs> Um, you know, well, what's, what's interesting is that, um, you know, even though we spent a lot of time together, we, we kind of know each other's story, but we really don't. It's like you grew up in Florida. And I'm just really curious, who really introduced you to basketball sports? Well, it's, you know, growing up when I grew up in the 80s in Florida, it was a basketball, I mean, I'm sorry, a football and baseball state. You know, oh. basketball was like the elementary school I went to, which in Florida at that time was first through sixth grade. We didn't even have a gym, an indoor gymnasium. Wow, our, in Florida. That's yeah, crazy. And, and our version of basketball was the rims, the double rims outside with the uh, chain nets that people would not even shoot baskets on. They used to do pull-ups on and see if they could bend the rims because it was those double steeled rims, right? Wow. And like the biggest event at my elementary school from first to sixth grade was the Turkey Bowl, which was when the sixth graders played the fifth graders in flag football. I mean, basketball was not even part of PE. Why they had the basketball courts even out there, I have no idea because we never used them. And then I go to junior high school, which was seven through nine, and I was introduced to basketball. And it wasn't by the basketball coach who is anybody that grew up in Florida and anybody knows back in those days of – elementary school, junior high, middle school, whatever it is, the basketball coach is the assistant football coach is the assistant right. track coach is, you know, because they get stipends for how many ever sports they coach. So I actually had a, uh, a kid who was my age and where I lived in Cocoa beach, you know, it was right there was uh, Merritt Island was the uh, Kennedy space center. So a kid's father got a job out at the space center transferred in from Virginia and he had been playing since he was three years old. And he actually taught me how to play, tried out for the seventh grade team, even though I'd only been working at it for about six weeks. I just happened to randomly meet him because he was in this in a uh, close neighborhood. And I got cut. Didn't even make the seventh grade team. Wow. And, then, and then he kind of became my coach. He, he made the seventh grade team, started – He's one of the best players, but he was the one that uh, taught me how to play the game, introduced me to the game. And uh, once I picked up uh, basketball, and at that point I'm 13 years old, once I picked up basketball, I stopped playing football and kind of dabbled in baseball a little bit, but really became focused on um, basketball. Tried out again in eighth grade, made the team. And the only reason why I played is because the seventh and eighth grade team the way the rules were, you had to have a group of seven players that played the first and third quarter and a group of seven players that played the second and fourth quarter. So I was on the first and third quarter group, and I wasn't, still wasn't one of the top five. I was like the sixth or seventh guy. So 
over a um, 32 minute game, I probably played six or seven minutes a game as a seventh grader. And then I made a ninth grade team and that was strictly just a ninth grade team. And I scored all of one point the whole year, but my claim to fame was somehow I had four pitchers in the yearbook, even though I only played one, only scored one point all year. <laughs> that's just, that's just personality right there. Uh, it was that electric smile that's made for radio. <laughs> you know, I eventually obviously was a late bloomer and played JV in ninth grade and really started that. That's kind of when I finally picked it up. It started to kind of come together, kind of connected. Started the year off in JV, finished on varsity, and then it kind of took off from there. And, um, you know, it was very fortunate that – Tony Longo was his name that from, you know, seventh grade was my personal coach. Wow. And um, we also had a guy uh, that once we got to high school, a guy by the name of uh, Rupert Stevens, same thing, had moved to uh, the Merritt Island area to work at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, grew up in Kentucky, obviously a uh, basketball state. Played in high school. I think he played at Eastern Kentucky in college or Austin P or something like or Austin P's in Tennessee, but one of those smaller schools in Kentucky got an engineering degree and then walked in the gym one day. We we're practicing and he goes, Hey, can I volunteer? And he kind of became a mentor for us because again, the basketball coach in high school, Haskell Light was also the chemistry teacher was the assistant football coach, but he actually had quite a reputation as a good basketball coach, which he was, but Rupert was a guy who uh, kind of took us under his wing, would come and open the gym for us, uh, started introducing us to lifting weights and different types of workouts. And, you know, by the time I got to high school, I was strictly playing basketball. And in between my junior and senior year, me, Tony, and a couple other guys I played with, uh, we drove around the state going to basketball camps. We went to Stetson's basketball camp. We went to Florida's basketball camp. We went to Florida State's basketball camp. And in between my junior and senior year, that's when things really started to take off and, you know, started getting recruited. And, uh, you know, by that time I was about six, nine, six, ten, but again, still thin as a rail, 195 pounds. The joke was I could stand behind a stop sign and you couldn't see me if I turned sideways, but because of guys like Rupert, because of guys like Tony Longa who played with me, I was really sound fundamentally and I knew how to play the game because I was taught the right way from the beginning. I didn't pick up a lot of bad habits and then have to break those bad habits as I was being taught how to play the game. I was taught how to play the game the right way from the ground up, really having no basketball background whatsoever. And then when I started to mature physically and things started to take off is when, uh, you know, everything kind of came together. And by the time, you know, I was a senior. I was, I think I was averaging like 32 points, 14, 15 rebounds. And it was very fortunate to, you know, as my parents always said, they were very fortunate that I was being recruited by division one schools. So obviously ended up getting a full scholarship to Vanderbilt. So under that happen, let me, let me ask you who, who were some of your other options? Because we know you ended up at Vandy, which is a great school, but who were some of the other options you were thinking about? Well, my parents were obviously heavily involved in, you know, my path. My dad was an engineer. My mom uh, was a nurse who also, uh, during my years in high school, went back to school to get her degree and advance in uh, nurse practitioner. So they were always pounding away at me about the importance of education. You know, it's, and I really didn't think about, quite honestly, Billy, I didn't think about playing professional basketball and, until I was going into my senior year at Vanderbilt. I always thought, saw it as a, uh, a mechanism to get a great education, you know, and in my parents' case, a free education. And, um, but they harped away at the importance of education. So I took my official visits to uh, obviously Vanderbilt, which was my very first visit. Then Georgia Tech, Bobby Cremens was the head coach. Wow. Then uh, Purdue, that was Gene Cady. And wow. then also Virginia was uh, Terry Holland. So uh, good, good coaches. You know, and the interesting thing is I never thought about it until later on in my career, but they were all older, very well-established coaches as well because as I think about the recruitment process, they would always harp in on my mother as, well, you know, we're going to be a father figure to your son away from the family. My mom really liked that. They, uh, they obviously, <laughs> this was not their first rodeo. <laughs> 
So, so, so you get to Vandy. What was your first impressions of I mean, He had a great coach. And that was the main reason why I went there. You know, I, listen, I know, and I've, I've talked about this all the time and I'll get your opinion on this in a minute, but you know, CM Newton was a guy that I related with. Obviously my parents related with my mom trusted him, believed in him. And, you know, going back to those other coaches in a minute, you know, Gene Cady, uh, my mom thought was a little too crazy, a little too demonstrative on the sidelines. Um, I can't remember exactly how she, I think she saw, I think she used the word. He was a little unstable, you know? Uh, so that kind of bothered her a little bit. Not that she didn't trust me going to play for him, but you know, that wasn't on the top of her list. Now you'll love this one. Uh, as will Steve Cohen, Bobby Crimmins, my mom loved him, but my mom grew up on a farm in Virginia and because Crimmins was from New York, she goes, I just don't trust people from New York. Yeah. <laughs> so, I, and the funny thing is, I have a great relationship with Bobby now because he always jokes about how he just never could figure out why I didn't come to Georgia Tech. And I've, I've told him numerous times, and he just found that hilarious because he goes, I always thought I had a great relationship with your mother. I guess I didn't. And... Uh, Yes, Mark Price. Mark Price actually was my host. So uh, they had some really good teams back then. And, um, I mean, I really thought about it, but it, it eventually it just – and Terry Holland was always the gentleman, but I can honestly say, you know, I was interested in, in Virginia, but they were like – out of the four schools were at the bottom of my list. But when they invited me to for my visit, it was actually going to be Ralph Sampson's last regular season home game. So I'm like, well, how can I pass that up? I'll get to go see Ralph Sampson play. Plus they were playing Maryland, Lynn bias. I was like, yeah, I'm going to, and plus, you know, they talked about, we'll come pick you up on a private plane. And I was like, I've never been on a private plane before. So, you know, unlike the recruitment. Yeah. Inc including the recruitment process of Billy Cartwright. I, had, I was never, you know, experienced that. So I jumped all over it. Now, listen, I loved my visit and they almost swayed me to coming there, but, it's just ultimately it was about CM Newton and how we related and the things that he talked about and the promises that he made and the assurances, quite honestly, he made to my parents. But I even talk about now it's as much as schools want to think that players come there for that, you know, it's that initial connection that, you know, players make with that coach and the coaching staff. So I'm curious with, you know, Billy about, what was it about San Francisco? Was it specifically the coach? I mean, you were a, you were a California guy, but is it the coach most notably over anything else? Well, mine was a little easier because there was three schools I was interested in. Now I didn't want to go out of California. So that boom, that's everybody gone. So that left UCLA, that left um, uh, SC and I really liked to coach at USF. So through elimination of, John wouldn't tell me that I wouldn't have a possibility of starting and I'm thinking I'm getting 39 a game. So you're out. I uh, went over to SC and they were uh, a little fragmented. Uh, actually, they had a couple players on their team that told me not to go to school there. So oh, wow. that, they were out and the USF was so gun ho and committed that even the starting center at that point in time, Howard Smith uh, was willing to give up his number. So I could go to school at USF. So they really wanted me. Uh, I was close to my home. And uh, boom, yeah, I was there. So uh, mine was a little, it was, it was a little bit easier. Um, and, you know, once again, like you, I was really close to my parents. Um, and interesting, like you, uh, as you go to Vandy, you guys had great teams there. Well, they were. I don't know about great at the time, but they were good. They were competitive. You know, CM Newton did a nice job of identifying student athletes that could go there, but also putting together teams that could compete. You know, we didn't necessarily have, you know, all Americans. We had guys that, uh, you know, were obviously really good high school players that had to be developed. So your juniors and seniors were your main contributors where, you know, I really didn't start playing until, you know, I had to register a year, so technically my sophomore year. 
but it was my third year on campus is when I kind of, you know, started to actually produce. And again, much like high school, you know, I really didn't have a significant impact until my junior and senior year. So I was, again, I kind of was that, you know, late bloomer. I developed late in high school, developed late in college. And, um, you know, but it was very fortunate, like you, Billy, that, you know, I had a coach in a program that really believed in me. And when I faltered, you know, they didn't waver. They stayed behind me. And that, and that meant a lot. So as you leave Vanderbilt, and you talked about the fact you weren't really sure about this NBA thing, uh, and you're about to get drafted. So what are you thinking? Well, the reason why, because I hadn't played those first three years, and I really didn't start opening any eyes until my junior year, because I remember, like, you know, players talk. So there were a couple players that I knew through other SEC schools that uh, were in Florida. We played together on uh, Florida, a team in Florida, which was an AAU team uh, that summer of uh, 83 when I graduated. And they were kind of sprinkled around the league a little bit. And when I had my big junior year, they were joking how when the, the season first started, there weren't really many lines under my name on the scouting report because I hadn't really <laughs> played a lot. I'd played enough, but not a lot. And I really, again, blossomed going into my junior year. And um, that pretty much changed quickly, but there were no NBA scouts there and there weren't other NBA scouts looking at Vanderbilt players. I mean, Jeff Turner, that's a name that some people might remember, went to the New Jersey Nets for a few years, played with the Orlando Magic, played over in Italy. You know, he was probably the most popular Vanderbilt player in those years, you know, prior to myself. But the first scouts didn't start showing up you know, at Vanderbilt until late in my junior year. And I remember once my senior year started, uh, CM Newton came up to me and also I had uh, John Martin was, or excuse me, Ed Martin was a coach who came over from TSU, kind of took me under his wing. He was like, hey, these guys want to talk to you. And I'm like, what guys? Who are you talking about? He's like, oh, NBA scouts. And I'm like, NBA scouts? Who are they here? Who are they here looking at? And he's like, they're here looking at you. That's why they want to talk to you. And literally, Billy, that's kind of when it first hit me. Now, obviously, I knew about the NBA and wanted to play, you know, always had dreams, but the aspirations were a little different because of, you know, I hadn't really had, you know, considerable success like you at an early point, you know, once I got to college, but then, you know, I had a really successful senior year. But, you know, that for me, and I remember talking to B.J. Armstrong about this. There was the utmost respect for the guys that had played in the NBA. Uh, there was a little fear as far as, you know, how would I adapt? Because, you know, I had success in high school and then back to square one and then built myself up in college. And then would I have the same type of, you know, experience when I get to the NBA, back to square one and build myself up? And the answer to that is actually yes. But, you know, there's so much unknown going into – the NBA, because at least in college, you're being recruited, just like these teams are all now coming to you as you're going into the NBA, recruiting you, wanting you to come work out for them, you know, take all these mental tests and, you know, physicals. And so you kind of have an idea of who's interested in you, but you have no choice. Your, your choice is taken out of the equation. They pick you. You don't pick them. So, you know, we're going in the draft night, and I have no clue. You know, I know the teams that are interested, the teams that I visited were the Chicago Bulls, the Phoenix Suns, the Charlotte Hornets. The, back then it was the Washington Bullets, uh, the Miami Heat, you know. And so the draft's in New York. We fly up there. You know, our, our good buddy Jerry Krause, God rest his soul, had, was always in contact with me and said, listen, I'm going to find a way to pick you. I don't know how, but I'm going to find a way. Because he goes, I know good and well that the that the Bullets want you at number 12. And I think at that point, I think the Bulls had number 17 or whatever pick after after the Bulls. And he goes, I know you won't make it past uh, Washington. We're up in New York the night before the draft. Fly up there with my parents. This is the best part of the whole story. So the the NBA isn't what it is now as far as the draft. So they put us up at a hotel, but they only pay for one room, right? 
So me and my parents are in the same room in New York. We go to dinner that night with my agent at the time, Bill Blakely, go back to the room. I ask him what's going to happen. He goes, I don't know, man. I just, I kind of like you. If I hear anything, I'll let you know. My parents go to bed. I, I decide it's Eastern time. So the news comes on at 11. The sports comes on at about 1120. I'm literally sitting on the edge of my bed because obviously there's two doubles in the room, right? And I got my face like two inches from the TV. You know, I don't want to, I had the volume up earlier, but my mom rolled over and was like, hey, can you turn that down? So literally I got it real low. The sports start and immediately the New York Knicks have made a trade. And he goes down the list and he's like, the New York Knicks have traded the 11th pick and Bill Cartwright to the Chicago Bulls for Charles Oakley. And I was like, holy crap. Jerry pulled it off. I'm going to Chicago. Turned the phone, turned the TV off and went to bed. Got up the next day, no call from Kraus, had not talked to my agent. And you know how secretive Jerry was. He didn't want to tell anybody what his plan was. He was afraid if he told my agent or told me, we might say something to somebody. So we go to the draft, which is in the afternoon, by the way. Not at night, not a big TV production. I'm not even sure it was on TV in, in 88. And uh, I get drafted by the Bulls, the 11th pick. I go to the desk, pick up the phone, talk to Jerry, hang up the phone, do a couple interviews. I kid you not. We go out the back door of Madison Square Garden. Uh, my dad was staying for business. My mom and I jump in a cab, go straight to the airport, same day, fly back to uh, Orlando because we had to fly in and out of Orlando. My mom goes home. I, I get a car and drive over to Indian Rocks Beach, which is uh, over by uh, Tampa, St. Pete, and go to a friend of mine from Vanderbilt Wedding. And that same day that I get drafted, I'm sitting on a beach in Florida that night wearing that shirt that you hold up when you're taking a picture with, the, with David Stern at a bonfire, which was illegal, by the way. And having a few beverages, celebrating the fact that I had just gotten drafted and was going to go play for the Chicago Bulls with none other than Bill Cartwright and Michael Jordan. So you get to Chicago. What, um, what did you really expect once you got there? What was, what was your expectations? First impressions? I, um, I was scared shitless. Because <laughs> first of all, I drove... So, you know, first of all, you know, I go, I sign my contract, go out to LA for the summer, you know, come to Chicago, or actually the suburbs of Chicago, go to fly in in Northbrook, have a quick uh, mini camp, fly out to LA, play out there for two weeks. And then after the mini camp, I fly home from uh, LA to Orlando. And then Jerry says, take a week and then come up to Chicago and start working out with Alvaro Mio, get ready for the season. So I'm like, all right. So um, I buy a car and I have like this little farewell tour as I'm driving up to, Chicago, up to Chicago. I stop and visit friends in Atlanta. I stop and visit friends in, in Nashville, stop and visit friends in Louisville, and then eventually get to Chicago. But I rolled through Chicago on a Saturday night, you know, like at 10 p.m. as I'm working my way up to Northbrook. Remember that old uh, Hyatt and Deerfield where we used to stay? I am. It's still there. Yep. And uh, there's literally abandoned cars on the side of the road, on blocks, no wheels. I'm like, this is like the movies, man. What have I gotten myself into? And I, I mean, I'm literally just, you know, I, I grew up in a small town, man, of less than 50,000 people. Yeah, I went to school at Nashville, but I didn't necessarily wander off of campus that much. And I was like, here I am in the big city of Chicago. I mean, I got to make, I can't let this city eat me alive. And even though we were in the suburbs and all that stuff, you know, I just, it took a while to adapt, but it was just like, if it wasn't that, if honestly, if it wasn't for you and Pax and especially Al Vermeil and guys that were in my corner and, and willing to kind of talk me off the ledge a few times, I'm not sure if I would have made it. Cause I just, I struggled a little bit, but it took me a while to adapt not only to the game, but to the physicality, to the city, to the schedule, uh, to the, the commitment, the sacrifice. It just, it's, it's a lot. 
Well, interesting is that <clears throat> one thing you should know is that you did a great job for the main reasons that you learned when every rookie had to learn is that how to work, how to put time in, uh, how to get adapted to living in Chicago, how to get adapted physically. Um, that's why I want you to talk a little bit about Al Vermeil and Eric Helm. Yeah. Well, first of all, let me say this too, Billy. You know, you were very kind to take me under your wing because we were battling for the same position. And I wasn't sure how to approach that because, you know, you were the starter. I wanted your minutes. You were obviously, you know, still much more skilled than I was, a better player. But you also, as you know, had certain physical limitations because, you know, it's some of the things you had dealt with throughout your career. But I used to always remember, um, we used to go to, what was that, Ada's Deli all the time oh, yeah. after practice. And Billy would always claim that he forgot his wallet. But I would just pepper you with questions, just constantly asking you questions because I was – so, Steve, what I was I, technically what I was trying to do, and I learned this at Vanderbilt, I was trying to cheat the process. I was trying to get all the answers ahead of time, you know, before the test. And I just remember one time we're eating, and, and Billy's just – and he stops, and he goes, you know, I'm not going to give you all the answers. Some things you're going to have to figure out yourself, and those answers only come with experience. I can, I can tell you some things. And then he literally, like, flippantly, this was the best part, he, like, looks at me, like, real serious, and then he goes back to eating, and then he's got mouth in his, he's got food in his mouth and stuff, and he goes, and by the way, you're trying to take my position, so I can't give you all my secrets, and just goes back to eating, like, to let that pass. But, you know, you asked about Alfred Meal and Eric Helen. So people know that's Dick Reveal's brother, but he was a well-renowned strength and conditioning coach who not only was the strength and conditioning coach, but he, he took it upon himself to be your friend, somebody that you could lean on. He would have us over to his house all the time and have meals. And it was just, you know, let's not talk basketball. Let's just be friends and cook out and make jokes and play golf with us. And, you know, you just kind of – you didn't really see him as a superior. You, you kind of saw him as an equal, even though he was well-established and – and um, when I struggled on the floor, you know, because I think, you know, Billy knows this, you know, when you, you practice every day, you work at the game, but you don't necessarily see results. You know, sometimes it, it, it makes it difficult to show up at practice every day or you sit at a game and you don't play and you get the score sheet and it says DNP, CD, did not play coach's decision. You're like questioning and, you know, am I going to make it here? You're not going to give up, but am I going to make it? And Al Vermeil was the guy who would, you know, help me in the weight room and talk about things I needed to work on, watch film with me. Um, you know, he had me doing squats and cleans and push press. And, but the funny thing was, they had me go back. I was doing a lot of things with a, a wooden stick, wasn't necessarily doing weights. And he would always get on. I'd always like, Al, this is bullshit. You know, I'm not, what am I doing here? He's like, well, I'm going to tell you. The first thing you got to do before we start throwing weight around is you got to get your technique down. And until your technique gets correct, I'm not just going to throw a bunch of weight on here and expect you to, to get stronger. You got to learn the technique. Technique is important. We got to build the platform. We got to build the base and work from there. And then it just is one of those things that I realized, well, if I got to build the base in the weight room, then I obviously have to build a base out on the floor. You know, you, you think because you're an established college player that you can just walk right in and play in the NBA, but you can't. It's not, it's not that easy. Um, and it, it was like one of those things, that, like what took me so long to figure that out? But that's also, you know, you kind of have to get out of your own way sometimes. And I, I know Steve Billy used to look at, give me these weird looks when I'd ask some questions or I'd respond to some of his questions. Almost like I, I literally, I knew that he wanted to reach out and smack me, but I don't, I think he knew that I, I don't, he didn't know how I would respond. So he didn't do it. So I know that I probably didn't figure things out as quickly as he thought I should. And some of that, it was, you know, me being stubborn, but 
you know, one of those things, the hindsight's 2020, you always thought about, man, if I just would have known, and then you're like, well, if you would have just paid attention, you idiot, you had a couple guys and Bill Cartwright and Alvar Meal who were trying to help you. But, you know, it's the old saying, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. Well, I just, I just really thought that, I, I, was, I, I just really thought that Al, it going to, now think about this, when I came in there, I was really old. I was probably, what, 31 or two. But uh, I, I had never done any cleans or snatches or you remember the running draws, the A ones, the A2, we never oh, did yeah. that. I, I never knew there was a way to run. So so you have this guy who is basically teaching you how to be a better athlete, how to be a better runner. Uh, that was specific to the sport. And that was the first time I had ever had that. So I had a really strong appreciation in that learning to be able to learn to be a better athlete. And consequently, um, you know, I was, I was better uh, working with Al and you guys were actually, everybody's workout was different and they were specific because I couldn't do a lot of the things you guys were doing, but uh, uh, he was able to make me better. And I always appreciated that. Well, and I always appreciated the work with you because uh, uh, I, I thought it really helped you. Oh, there's no doubt about it. But I'm curious, I mean, both mentally and physically. But I'm curious, you know, because I walked into this. So I feel very fortunate because it, it wasn't just about strength. I mean, I was all about strength, <clears throat> explosiveness, conditioning. But he was also about recovery and, um, you know, I'm curious because of, I mean, the other thing that people don't realize is Al Vermeil would go to Europe, would go to Russia, go to different places every year because yes. a lot of the stuff we were doing was uncommon. It was not, that was, you know, when people thought about weightlifting, they thought about bodybuilders. And Al was like, no, no, no. There's so many different aspects to, you know, strength training and the conditioning and, you know, I was also into recovery and how do you take care of your body and, and all this stuff. And I was very fortunate that I walked into that from day one. And I'm curious if you had a guy like Al Vermeil with you from day one, how much different would your career have been? Oh, it would have been a lot, it would have been a lot better. I would have been, a, I would have been a lot better athlete. Um, I would have been stronger, faster. Um, but that just wasn't the times, you know, we, Alvar Bill was the first strength coach uh, I had ever had. We never had a strength coach in New York. So we, you were really on your own to, to, to get better. We didn't lift during the season. Uh, you lifted after the season was over and, and hopefully try to keep some of those gains. So um, it, was, it was just a great, great time of, of learning. And we had a bunch of young guys, uh, guys like you, BJ Armstrong, Scott Williams, Stacey King. Um, did you feel kind of bonded with those guys because you had the young guys coming in who were really in a similar situation that you were in trying to establish themselves in the league as, as young guys? Yeah, I, I always thought I could share things with them. Um, you know, because the funny thing was, for the longest time, as you talked about, the Bulls team had significant turnover, but the core stayed the same. Yes. Throughout, you know, now – after those first three championships is when maybe the core started to change a little bit through trades, through expansion, uh, free agency. But, you know, as far as that, that goes, I mean, from the time I was there, I mean, you're talking about, you know, as you talk about Billy for what a seven, eight year window, it was basically Pax, MJ, Scotty, Horace, and you, you know, that was the starting five. And, and guys kind of come in, you know, the other, what, seven, eight spots, guys kind of came and went. But you also had myself. I was always there. BJ was always there. But, again, Stacy, uh, Scott Williams, guys that played the same position. You know, I remember, remember Scott came in as an undrafted guy, and I kind of – Scott and I became very close because eventually we went from the multiplex, which people need to understand was just a gym that they <laughs> built – Here's the, the best part, Steve. They built this gym on the end of a health club and they didn't even make it uh, regulation length. I mean, it was kind of weird. They were like, they built this 
basketball court that we started using. And then Al Vermeil had this real tiny area where we would work out. And a lot of times we'd have to go over to uh, the health club aspect and work out amongst all the patrons while they were there as well. But it was just Scott and I, eventually we had our own uh, practice facility, which they called the Birdo Center. And Scott and I had lockers next to each other in the Birdo Center because while we were at the multiplex, we didn't have lockers. You came in dressed for practice. When practice was over, you put your sweats on and you left. You went home. There was no lockers, no locker room, nothing, you know? And once we had the practice facility, Scott Williams and I had a locker next to each other. And I kind of became his Bill Cartwright. He would ask a lot of questions and we would talk a lot. And, you know, it's kind of funny. I always tell this story and it, it's just, again, as Billy's talking about, youth rears its head all the time. And I remember like the first practice is over and Bill's got ice on his, his knees and his elbows. And I'm like, what's wrong with you? And he goes, Oh, don't you worry. Time will come. And I literally remember like after practice sitting in the locker room at the Birdo center, I got ice on my knees. I think something on my quad and Scott Williams just comes bouncing in. He's got his shoes untied. He's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, you'll learn. <laughs> and it's just, it's just as, it's kind of like one of those things, right? You have a father and he tell, gives you all this advice and leads you down the path and hopes that you listen and hope you succeed. And, you know, Billy did the same thing. And you learn later on in life, you're like, you know, he was, he was speaking the truth. He was, you know, he was, and it, but it was like, it was almost like you think about it. Once you're drafted, it's almost like you take an oath about, hey, it's my responsibility to help the younger guys. If they want to lean towards me for advice, I'll be more than willing to give it. And, you know, Bill did that for me. And he, but he also did it for other guys, too. And I, and I know we didn't also always show the appreciation that we should have, but I think part of that was we were also, um, you know, just competing for the same position. So that was – you know, and I will also say this, Steve, on the road a lot when we would get to cities, whether it was Salt Lake City, Utah, or Sacramento, Billy would introduce me to all his friends. I thought that was special, too. The funny thing was all his friends always forgot their wallet, too. It's amazing exactly. how that works. <laughs> but it's just he would always be like, hey, if you don't have anything to do, you don't have any friends or any plans, you can always come with me. And well, he, would, I, I, he would always do that. I, I I thought that um, you know you you came to Chicago at a really special time because you were able to win three championships. What championship do you remember most fondly? Oh, by far the first one, the you Lakers. Yeah, and it wasn't about because it was the Lakers. It was about, I mean, seriously. There's I I was fortunate enough, and I'll group this all together. I was fortunate enough to win four championships with two different organizations. The, the Spur, I mean, the, the Bulls in 91 and the Spurs in 99. It's the same reason for both. Once I had kind of realized what I was accomplishing and a part of and kind of matured, I realized the importance of, not, of, the, of the moment, not only to me, but to my teammates, especially Billy, John Paxson, obviously MJ, um, Trent Tucker, all these, you know, we talked about these guys that kind of came and, and went, but more established older players because of the fact that w the adversity they had been through. And I can honestly say it was the first time that I've seen grown men cry at an athletic event. And that's really when it hit me this, the, the, of what we had just accomplished. Um, Billy, what was the, what was the name of your older friend? Was it, uh, with the white hair, the mustache? We not talking about my high school coach, Dan Risley. Uh, I don't know. Remember he always came to Chicago with his wife periodically. Um, he was yeah, always that's in it. sack. Huh? That's it. Yeah. It, yeah. My high school school. As a matter of fact, uh, I just spoke with him last week. Yeah, but he was he always wore the uh, the the uh, uh, he always wear uh, slacks and a blazer 
when Billy and, and everybody else was wearing jeans. And so that was your old high school coach, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I just remember somehow when that last, that game five was over against the Lakers, he somehow got out on the floor and you guys were hugging and you were crying and just, and to watch packs and stuff like that. I was like, I mean, that I was, it wasn't like I was stunned, but it was just, this was the guy who I had always seen was kind of the hard ass. The only emotions I ever saw out of Billy was frustration, anger, and laughter. But I'd never seen joy and jubilation like that when we won that championship. And that's why it was so memorable. And the reason why I say you take it full circle, I was able to experience the same thing with Sean Elliott and David Robinson um, and, and guys like that in San Antonio who were older or just as old as I was, but guys that had never experienced that before. And now I was a veteran player. And obviously I, they, they weren't trying to win it for me, but I was trying to help win it for them because you had such established players that had never been there before. And that's why I say those two particular championships were the ones that really stand out for me and mean the most to me. Well, we'll talk about those two teams because <laughs> obviously we had Phil, Phil Tex, guys like Johnny Bach, uh, Jimmy Rogers, Jim Clemens. Uh, we had great coaches and you were very similar in San Antonio. Talk about the similarities when you uh, – Got traded to uh, San Antonio. And by the way, who'd you get traded for? Dennis Rodman. Dennis Rodman. <laughs> yeah, I always to always joke about how Jerry changed his ways because Jerry always talked about, he goes, I want a team with character, not a bunch of characters. And then he traded for the biggest character in the league. <laughs> I was like, well, uh, hey, I always pride myself on the fact that I was traded for a player that's in the Hall of Fame. So I, I, I guess I can't complain about that. But, you know, you're right. It's... It was an organization that was changing its culture with Greg Popovich at the helm. At the time when I got traded, Bob Hill was the coach and Greg Popovich was the general manager, but he talked about how he wanted to establish some of the similarities as far as the culture goes that they had established in Chicago with Jerry Krause going out and hiring uh, Phil Jackson, and but also the Al Vermeil aspect and, you know, just putting players in a position to succeed. And, and also another thing I think was uh, a good mixture of veterans and, and, and younger players, but also the culture and the accountability that they expected from their players. You know, you had to have a lot of trust and responsibility because you, you know, it wasn't like you were in, in there like football. You're there at the facility 10 to 12 hours a day from the time they leave, arrive to the time they leave where basketball, you may be there four hours max between weightlifting and, and practice. So there's a lot of trust going on. And what are you doing outside of, you know, the time you're in the gym, you're with your teammates. Accountability was big and they were able to establish that in San Antonio. And eventually we all saw as they, you know, became one of the iconic franchises because of the number of championships they've been able to win, but also how well they drafted or the, the trades they made or the ability to attract free agents. And it was very it was an easy transition because of the expectations, but also I kind of enjoyed the fact that, you know, I had some credibility with the championships and, and they were always asking a lot of questions and that kind of helped me with the relationships with the Sean Elliott's and the David Robinson's and guys like Malik Rose, a younger player who I also took under my wing and, and helped mentor a little bit. And then much like Billy, you know, Malik Rose, a guy I helped, but then it ended up taking my position and it eventually pushed me out of the league. <laughs> but that's just, that's just how the league goes. Eventually, as Billy and I talk about, there's only one player that's undefeated in the NBA, and that's Father Time. So you leave uh, San Antonio, and did you end up back in Chicago? Yeah, so I went back to Chicago for a year of the Tim Floyd era. And then that's when you got to remember that was Ron Artest and, or, you know, however – Meta World Peace, however you want to refer to him, and and uh, Elton Brand, and remember B.J. Armstrong came back at the same time. We were brought back to try to mentor these guys and help Tim Floyd, but that was a train wreck, man. Um, I had seen some things and experienced some things I'd never seen before, and one of the things I did not experience was a lot of wins while I was there. But I was there for a year, 
Uh, it was a long year. Um, that was a long year. As a matter of fact, I was there. Uh, yeah. I was there so, as an assistant coach. So that yeah. was, uh, you know, a, uh, a lot of what I was I'm talking about. So, you know, it's, I can honestly say, Billy, it's and not because of you or anything else, but that's kind of, there's some times in there that I, I cherish, but there's a lot of times in there, unlike a lot of years of my career, where I just wanted to forget a lot of things. Well, you guys have talked a little bit about Jerry Krause and how astute he was. I've heard you will say that 99% of his decisions were really good, but could you speak to Tim Floyd, who obviously was underwhelming as a coach, did Jerry have a blind spot towards him? Well, I think that, that, you know, obviously we all know about the discourse between Jerry and Phil Jackson. Jerry, in my opinion, and I wish he was here to, you know, answer these questions, always felt that, you know, not one particular person, whether it be coach or player, is, is bigger than the team. And I think there's – some truth to that because of the importance of teamwork, but it was, we always, we also, we all know how big Michael Jordan was and Scotty Pippen, but you know, Phil had a lot to do with that, but you know, I just felt like Jerry always thought that, Hey, I can replace Phil and still succeed. But also when Phil left, Michael retired. So all of a sudden you come in with Tim Floyd, who he was very high on, and I, I, I personally feel like Tim Floyd knew the game and he understood the game. But what he had a problem dealing with was the, the players in the NBA, the salaries that the players made. Um, he didn't relate very well. Um, and I think his, he was overwhelmed. You know, he just wasn't suited, in my opinion, for the NBA. And he, just, he did not deal with the egos very well. He did not deal with players, you know, I don't want to necessarily say talking back, but it wasn't, you know, the one thing I always talk about going from college to the NBA is it's not just one rule applies to every player. There's 14 players. There's 14 different rules. And you as a player just have to accept that everybody's treated differently. And I think, you know, whether Jerry would admit that was a mistake or not, but he also, there were some circumstances. He didn't think that Michael would actually retire and leave, you know, him with all these young guys. And all of a sudden the franchise does a total 180 and, you know, eventually Jerry is, is, you know, pushed out of Chicago. So as, and that's the other thing, you know, we talked about at the very beginning of this about Al Vermeil. that was Jerry Krause's idea. We need to get Al Vermeil in here and start working with these players and, and teaching them about strength training and conditioning and explosiveness and, and then all these Olympic lifts. That was Jerry Krause's idea, not, Doug Collins' idea, not, you know, uh, Phil Jackson's idea, not uh, um, Jerry Reinsdorf's idea. This was something that Krause was adamant about. And, you know, he was a, ahead of his time. He instituted that. And that's, as Billy talked about, you know, wh- how long would his career actually have last or how different would it be if he would have had that when he was with the Knicks. It's just unfortunate because of the, the squabble he had with Phil who was looked at as a media darling, and Jerry obviously was not. Jerry thought the, the media was the enemy. You know, I think that, unfortunately, it, it kind of clouded people's opinions of what they thought about Jerry Krause, and he's never really, in my opinion, given the credit that he's due for what he was able to build in Chicago. I know, I know Bill feels that way, and a lot of people after the last dance felt like, hey, they're kicking somebody down who's not there to defend himself. But, you know, I have a lot of questions about that. I'm sure Bill does. But one question, you have gone on to a very successful media career. And what did you learn from Jerry Krause's deficiencies in that area about you have to get along to go along, ostensibly. You have to get along with people and to shape perception, right? Yeah, and the, the, probably the most important thing I learned with that Bulls team quickly was because it was an older, more established team, you know, a lot of times Billy and I would go to lunch after practice, but a lot of times he had family obligations and he, he would go his direction and John Paxson would go his direction and Michael Jordan would go his direction. We'd go in 14 different directions, right? And whether you liked a guy or not, whether you thought he practiced hard enough or whether you thought he was committed enough, the one thing I was fortunate enough, you know, we had guys that were committed, guys that put in the work, and it wasn't personal. 
We had arguments in practice. We had fights in practice. But once we stepped on that court and crossed that line, we all were in this together. And it took a while for that to happen. It took a while for Michael to accept that. And Billy was a big part of helping Michael understand that because, you know, Billy made a lot of commitments or should I say sacrifices dealing with the situation in the Knicks and his injuries. But Michael saw how hard he worked and the time he put in. And it slowly changed the perception of, of, you know, what Michael thought about his teammates. But, you know, eventually everybody came together and was able to accomplish the same goal, regardless of what they thought about each other personally. Because, you know, Billy will tell you, we didn't necessarily spend a lot of time together as a team. Like there weren't really a lot of team parties. There weren't really a lot of, you know, uh, dinners with 10, 11, 12 guys. But we all came together for the same goal in practice and, and, and at games, and we made it work. And, you know, that's where that you had that veteran presence had a lot to do with that. It provided that stability when, you know, things could have definitely broken at the seams and everything could have went south, but it didn't. So you leave Chicago and you ended up going to Portland. Um, talk about that and talk about, <clears throat> because you were getting older then. We know you're oh, really yeah. old and you were thinking about maybe doing something else. So talk about that year and talk about some of the things you think about as an older player about what's next. Well, I think you dealt with this. When when you get older now, you're trying to look for stability, right? You're trying to look for um, a situation that's not going to be a drastic change. And I chose to go to Portland as a free agent for a lot of reasons. I thought they had good young players. I thought they, you know, could be successful. Rasheed Wallace, Damon Stoudemire, Dale Davis, Bonzi Wells. But it was just unfortunately very dysfunctional. Hey, who was coaching there? Uh, Mike Dunleavy. Mike Dunleavy. And unfortunately, you know, he, in my opinion, you know, there's two things. I mean, you've been a head coach. You've been an assistant coach. You can take two approaches. You can coach your way, and if you get fired, you got fired doing it your way. Or you can try to do it their way, meaning the player's way, and almost you almost become the player's friend. And eventually the players will try to run over you. And I think that's what happened. I mean, with, with those guys, the young guys and the immaturity at the time, they took care, they took advantage of that friendship that they had with Mike Dunleavy. And it, it was just totally dysfunctional. I mean, we had timeouts where we were constantly yelling at each other, you know, F this, F that, you know, and I'm just like, as a, you know, this was my, what, 12th year in the league. And I'm just like, I'm, dumbfounded that this is going on during a timeout. Listen, the other team just went on a 10-0 run. We're calling a timeout, and guys are wanting to, to throw down during the timeout. How about we figure out what's going on here so we can, you know, stop this 10-0 run and turn the tables on them? But it just – at times it would make things worse. And I just – it was really hard for me to, to fathom that, especially as an older player because I had been with two very established uh, – teams that had won championships that had developed cultures, responsibility, accountability. And all of a sudden I get to this place and I'm like, what the hell is going on? And you can even remember they brought in uh, uh deadless shrimp out of retirement to try to st- stabilize everything that was going on. And that didn't help. I ended up deadlift when I used to like Bill eat lunch all the time and talk about what the hell have we gotten ourselves into? <laughs> was that left pay? What's that? Did that left pay? Oh, all the time. He didn't have alligator arms like Bill did, <laughs> but it was just, and, and, and that kind of, quite honestly, that kind of soured me on the game because that's when the game had kind of started, started to change a little bit. Players were now obviously, you know, getting more power, had, had a bigger voice. And it just, as I was getting towards the end of my career, it just, that's when I think Billy dealt with also as you're older, you're just like, now there's so many other, aspects that are involved it's not just basketball anymore um and you start to wonder is is this really worth it because you're still making a lot of sacrifices you're still pushing yourself you're still trying to um you know reach uh perfection 
you know, there's no sitting back on your laurels being like, yeah, I've won four championships. I'm just going to kind of coast. I was always trying to find ways to contribute, trying to find ways to push myself. And when you're not playing, you also find yourself going back later at night or, you know, working on doing extra conditioning, getting up extra shots. So, and it just, at that point, I kind of reached the, the point where I was like, you know, I think I've, I'm about done here. Um, after that year, I was a free agent. Um, they brought me back, but eventually cut me and traded me to the Clippers because, and not to play, the Clippers needed my salary and my contract to get over the, the lower threshold, meaning that they had, if you, you know, I don't think people, a lot of people know this, that there's a floor. Everybody knows about the salary cap, but there's a right. salary floor that every team has to spend a certain amount of money on players. You can't just go as cheap as possible so that the players got a certain percentage of you know uh, the revenue and this, the Clippers needed my salary of my contract to get above that threshold so I basically got traded to the Clippers but they called my agent and said yeah he doesn't even need to report we just need his salary so we'll just pay him um, over the next six months but he's technically we're going to release him after 48 hours but that's also when you kind of feel like well I guess I'm done here because nobody's interested I mean they're not even interested in me as a player and a person. They just want my salary. And that kind of pushed me away from basketball and eventually got into broadcasting. You know, the interesting thing is I still thought I could play, but also I was an older veteran player, meaning wherever I went, they had to pay me the veterans minimum, which I think at that time was like one, three, one, four. And I had a couple teams that actually called and were interested, but they wanted me to come and try out. And I was like, I don't need to try out. You know what I can do. And I finally got a general manager who was honest with me and just said, hey, I hate to tell you, but the last collective bargaining agreement did veteran players wrong. He says, in order for us to bring you in, we got to pay you the veterans minimum, which was, you know, you guys thought was going to help you guys make more money, but it actually hurts older players like you because if we want to bring you in, which we would like to because of your experience and how we think you can help younger players, we got to pay you $1.3 million when I can sign a second year guy for like 450, 500. And because we're close to the caps salary cap, you know, we can't afford to bring you in and we can save ourselves, you know, that million dollars or 800,000 that we can save plus the penalties for being in the salary cap adds up to more like a million. So unfortunately we're going to sign this guy that I promise you will never play and probably won't really help the team, but it just fits into the, the, the uh, structure better from a financial standpoint. And that's kind of when I was like, all right, I'm done here. You know, it's not just about basketball. Hey, talk about two things. Talk about how did you get into broadcasting? And then I want you to talk about, because you, you, you watch a lot of games, talk about the NBA now compared to when you came in the league. And what do you think it's – the biggest change? Well, you know, the first part is I got into broadcasting because I was a communication major at Vanderbilt. And I actually did some internships at radio stations and TV stations in the summers when I was at Vanderbilt and thought I always wanted to get into that. And uh, I reached out to a guy by the name of John Martin at ESPN and I got an agent and he brought me on and tried me out. And I started doing NBA games for ESPN radio. And it eventually, you know, became a, an analyst now with NBC sports Chicago, but, that was my way of staying connected to the game. But as soon as the game was over, our biggest question was, Hey, where are we going to dinner and what kind of wine are we buying? It wasn't about, Hey, we got to watch film and we got to do this. And we got to, you know, layman about the loss and how do we make changes? It was like, Hey, our, we're over, we're done, finished. But that was also how I stay, stayed connected. But it also keeps me watching a lot of basketball as you're talking about Billy. And it's, you know, obviously it's become a much more offensive minded game. The rules have changed to favor an offensive player. Um, I will honestly say just from a viewing standpoint, it's made it a lot more aesthetically pleasing for the average fan. But I think it also takes a little bit out of a uh, little bit of the strategy out of it. But I still think it's a very enjoyable game. I love watching it. I, I love enjoying the pace. I know the average fan loves the high scoring game, but I just wish that they didn't make such drastic changes uh, to hamper the defense. 
you know, and I, I know people are like, well, who wants to watch a 92 88 game? Well, I, I do because I think it takes, it requires a lot of strategy. It requires a lot of, um, you know, in my opinion, forward thinking. Um, but that's, you know, you got to change with the times and in our society now, you know, people want instant results. And so you want something that's a little more up pace, a little faster. And that's what they've got. I mean, again, I love the game. Obviously I think players are much more athletic now than they were when, you know, Billy and I played. And so the game suits them more because they are ath- more, more athletic, not necessarily better basketball players, but athletes, in my opinion, that are then made to be basketball players. But the game has suited to be to better – the game has become better suited to more athletic players the way it is now being played by the rules. How's your family? Doing good. You know, so my parents are still down in Florida, so I haven't been able to go down and see them. I, you know, the funny thing was my mom actually called last night and left a six-minute voicemail. <laughs> and I still talk to my mom now more often now than I have ever because of the COVID. That's how you stay in touch. FaceTime. You know, my son's 17. Uh, he's 6'8, 230 pounds. Wow. Doesn't play basketball, plays lacrosse. Is a, is a, a deep hole. So he's very intimidating. And uh, he's a junior. He's mastered online schooling. And, um, he doesn't like to play basketball with dad. He plays, you know, for fun, but he, he will go out and we'll play a lot of uh, uh, horse together. He doesn't necessarily want to play basketball because I can still beat him. So he doesn't like to lose. So we'll go out and play horse. And he has a tendency to beat me more at horse than I, than uh, I'd like. Well, thank you so much for being on. Um, you know, I, I always really admired the fact that, you know, basketball is such a, great sport because you can really make yourself into the player that you want to be. And to me, that's what really happened with you is because when you came out, you were a stick. Oh yeah. You were an absolute stick, but you worked, you stayed with it. Uh, you did what, what people asked of you. You got great results. Uh, everybody would love to have four championships. Yes, they so, would. And I think it's just such a tribute to the to the fact that you 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 were a real pro of the league, and I, I really appreciate it. Well, I, I think that's a reflection on you as much as it is anything in John Paxson, but also your persistence of as stubborn as I was, you you still kind of kept coming back to the well trying to help me, but I, I learned a lot. And, you know, I was very fortunate, as I said, to have, you know, some really solid veteran leadership and Al Vermeil, but even Al Vermeil would talk to me about, you know, really stick to Billy's hip and learn from him. You know, he's been through a lot. And um, I was glad that I kind of, you know, it took a while, but I eventually learned. But, you know, that's the other thing I try to explain to players in this age now. You have so many resources at your fingertips. Use those resources. And the biggest thing I always try to share is, is you have to, in order to really – use those resources. You have to put yourself in an uncomfortable position, making yourself very vulnerable. And that vulnerability though, will teach you a lot and help actually help make you a better player and a better person. Cause you know, we all like comfort. We don't want to go outside of our bubble, but you know, I had no choice that if I truly wanted to succeed, I had to come outside of that bubble, that comfort zone and have to figure things out. And, it, and that's also really, I think in, in my case, we're going to college helped significantly and also not only going to college, but, you know, I was there for five years, not four. So I dealt with a little adversity there of almost flunking out of Vanderbilt, not playing a lot. So that taught me a lot as well. So, you know, it's just, you really can learn from your experiences if you'll take the time to slow down and, and, and do that. Awesome. Well, you did it well. And remember, hey, we got to see each other soon because uh, remember. You, I owe you, you a bunch of meals, right? But, you know, it's kind of funny. <laughs> This is how things go full circle. I, you referred to me as a guy coming out of college as a stick. And now you and I play golf and we'd love for somebody to be like, Hey, Will Purdue, he's a stick. Meaning that you got a, you're a pretty damn good golfer with a low handicap. So maybe my life will go full circle. Cause I, I would like the people now to see me. 
out on the course or see me somewhere and be like, yeah, that guy's a stick. He's a golfer. Hey, I don't mind that. <laughs> well, that's the next step too. Good golf and, uh, and a meal. I'm, I'm, I'm for that. Yeah. Well, the, here you're finding this interesting. We'll put this, you know, when Billy lived in, uh, I just had dinner at Nowood country club a couple of weeks ago with a friend oh. of mine by the name of Adrian peace. Who's a member there. And very rarely do I actually get to get, get there. But the thing is, though, whenever I'm there, I always get a brand new Bill Cartwright story at Knollwood because Bill was a member there. And, and, and the best part is they just talk about how long his clubs were and just they don't necessarily call him a good golfer. They call him a great guy. Big hitter. They always, big hitter. Yeah, big hitter. <laughs> but they said they, it, it, it may go three fairways over, but it was going a long way. That's all I wanted. They always, they always talked about how nice and generous he was to the staff, which I, I said, are you, are we talking about the same Bill Cartwright? But there's only one Bill Cartwright that I know of. Well, guys, th thanks so much, guys. Thank you, Will. I really enjoyed it. Yes. Well, Billy, Steve, I appreciate it. And um, this is the one thing that Bill, I, always, I know I say last things, but this is the one thing I will, there's one friend of Bill's that I will never forget his name and that's because he was always around and I could never confirm whose dime he was on around but Terry that's right, my buddy my high school buddy Terry Soffer that's yep. right I wasn't He's... sure if he lived with you or not and I don't know if you kicked him out or if your <laughs> wife kicked him out but I knew when he showed up in Chicago it was a minimum of a six week stay <laughs> Well, and, and the good part is that I know he's looking for you too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, much like you, I'm sure he says I owe him money for some reason. Of course. <laughs> uh, awesome guys. All right, guys. I appreciate it. Thank you so yeah. much.